at uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, neighbor as yourself. And so we've been looking at these various imperatives. Last week was follow, follow me. That was an imperative. As you're turning to the Gospel of Mark, where we'll see our imperative today, let me test your, your knowledge of superheroes. Are you ready to be tested on your knowledge of superheroes? If I said he's faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, and leaps over tall buildings in a single bound, who would I be talking about? Yes, you guys are so much brighter than Saturday night. Last night they said Spider-Man. Spider-Man is no comparison to Superman. Superman is faster than a speeding bullet. He's the one that can leap over buildings in a single bound. He's stronger than all that. Superman. Well, what is more powerful? This isn't superhero now. What is more powerful than the mountain that's looming in front of you? What is more powerful than that mountain that casts a shadow on Every moment of your day, just it's always there. It doesn't seem to move. What is, what is more powerful than that mountain? Anybody? Mountain moving faith. Jesus said, faith, have faith in God. Remember the story of the fig tree? That's in Mark chapter 11 where Jesus cursed a fig tree. That's really an odd event. Jesus cursed the fig tree and and then the, the, they came back the next day, and the disciples see it all withered up from the roots up. And, and, and they say, hey, Lord, the fig tree. And basically they were saying, how did you do that? And he said, have, and that word have is an imperative, have faith in God. And then he went on uh, to use the word believe. He said, for if you believe, you will have the things you're saying. You will have them. And that word believe is in the imperative. And so uh, we see that, that whole idea of faith and using faith. Have faith. Have was in the imperative. Have faith. And then use that faith. Believing. That's in the imperative. All right, now many of you are already writing down, okay, our imperative today is faith. No, no, I just, I'm just setting you up. Because even though Superman was, was faster than a speeding bullet, he's more powerful than a locomotive, he can leap over buildings in a single bound. There's kryptonite. Right? So what's stronger than Superman? Kryptonite. You know the old uh, uh, movie plot how somebody hides kryptonite in Clark Kent's pillow or something and, and the strength is just slowly ebbing away and will they discover the kryptonite in time? Or will life as we know it cease to be? Well, you've gone to those movies. Kryptonite. See, kryptonite could, could defeat Superman. Aren't you glad there's more to the sermon to come? You're going to go home. What did he talk about there? Kryptonite. Superman. <laughs> kryptonite. Look at Mark chapter 11. There's kryptonite for your faith. See, what is stronger than that mountain that's looming over your life, that casts its shadow of defeat over everything? What's more powerful than that mountain? Well, faith. Have faith in God. Faith in God can move that mountain, but watch out for kryptonite. Watch out for something that can just take all the force out of that faith. Notice, notice the words of Jesus. And, and, and Peter said, you know, and their disciples, how did this happen? Look at that, look at that fig tree. And, and Jesus gives this great answer about, about faith. Verse 23, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatsoever things you ask when you pray, believe that's an imperative, that you receive them and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. That's an imperative right there, forgive him. That your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses, but if you do not forgive, 
Neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. That little word but is important there in verse 26. It, it, it means in, in strong contrast to everything that's just been said. Everything about mountain moving faith. Everything that's just been said. If you don't forgive, your Father in heaven is not going to forgive you. Didn't Paul write under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 too? He, he said, even if I have faith to move mountains and have not love, I'm nothing. It can negate it all. I'm, you, you, you can have an anointing to prophesy and, and have faith to move mountains, but if you don't have love, nothing. So when you stand praying, imperative, forgive. Forgive. For if you do not forgive, if you have anything against anyone, if, if, let's put it this way, if you have anything on someone, they really did something to you, it's legit, you have a right to be angry at them. But if you have anything like that, he says, I want you to forgive. It's an imperative. I, I, I want you to forgive. Well, we've done superheroes. How about, how about we do a little house on the prairie? Can you picture that time era? Little house on the prairie, you know, a horse and buggy days, country church. I, I read a story that really applies to what we're talking about today. And, and Mary wrote her story, and, and, and I'll just tell it to you briefly. Mary was a young, young lady that fell in love with a man who wanted to be a preacher. And all oh, the lifestyle she envisioned for herself, the wife of a preacher. And she grew up in the church, and she grew up in a poor family in the church. They went to church every week, and, and she admired the preacher's wife. And, and when she fell in love with John, and that John wanted to be a preacher, wow, a dream come true. I'm going to be a preacher's wife. Back in Little House on the Prairie kind of days. And, and so she married John, and, and John had just finished his seminary education, and they gave him his first assignment. It was to a country church way out in the middle of seemingly nowhere. But Mary loved John. Mary loved the Lord. Now she's a preacher's wife. But, but her dream turned into a nightmare because even though he was eloquent in the pulpit and he was nice to the people at home, John was a monster. John lived two lives. He had two faces. He could, he could say all the right words when he had his clerical collar on. But at home he was mean and cruel and abusive and... And this dream of a beautiful married life that Mary had just crumbled at the, the meanness, the brutishness of John. Well, she always dreamed as a little girl, her family never had much money, but she always dreamed that one day she'd go to Easter service in a beautiful dress. She never had a beautiful dress. Well, their first Easter in the ministry was coming up, and, and, and so she wanted a beautiful dress. They didn't have much money, hardly any money. So she started saving, scraping things together. When they, when they would take the eggs from their, their chickens to the, uh, sell them at the general store, she'd always hold back a few, few money, a little bit of money to, to buy some fabric. She saw this beautiful pink fabric. Had violets on it. And there was some lace at the store, too. And she dreamed she could make herself this beautiful dress with pink and, 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 and purple and, and lace. And, oh, she could see herself in that dress. Finally, on Easter, she's going to have a pretty dress. And, and the months went by. She saved up enough, and she bought that fabric. And secretly at night, she wanted to surprise John and show, her how beautiful, show him how beautiful she could be. And she sewed by the light of the fire, and she made herself this beautiful dress. And a couple of days before Easter, John came home in one of his moods. She had laid the dress out on the bed, eagerly wanting to show it to John and, and anticipating a smile on his face and, and a comment, how beautiful she'll look, how proud he'll be to have her as his wife on Easter Sunday. But he was in one of those moods, and John came storming into their house. He saw that dress on the bed. He assumed she bought it, not made it. She, he assumed she bought it. He picked it up, and he said, Frivolous! We're scraping money together. We can't even afford the essentials. And look how frivolous you are. And in his anger, he ripped it to shreds and threw it on the floor and walked out. Her heart was crushed. She had been putting up with his abuse all these months. But now, this was like the, the last straw. And she said to herself, she said, I'm, I'm going to divorce John. I don't know how. It was different in those days. I don't know how, but she also knew that once a year the bishop on his rounds to all the area churches, the bishop would come and she thought, I'm going to save this ripped up dress. I'm going to hide it in the bottom of our trunk 
and, and, and when the bishop visits, I'm going to find an opportunity to show him this dress and, and prove this will be evidence what a monster John is. And certainly he'll help me divorce him and, and grant the church's approval. And, and I'll just go home to mom. And she waited for weeks for Bishop Hansen to come. And finally, Bishop Hansen came, and, Hansen came and, and I want to read you part of, of his sermon that day. And she, she, she got this nervous anticipation. This is my time now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out this dress, and I've got to find the right time to show it to the bishop, and certainly he will, he will get me out of this marriage. Well, he was going to preach that Sunday morning, and there didn't seem to be any, any time for her to talk privately, but John had said he had to do some things that afternoon, and Bishop would be preaching that night. He would be studying in the afternoon for the evening meeting. So she thought, when John is gone in the afternoon, I'll show the dress to Bishop Hansen and it'll be over. I'll get out of this. But that Sunday morning, he stood to preach and he asked the congregation to turn to Mark chapter 11. And he began to preach from verse 25 from the King James, when ye stand praying, forgive. And then he said these words, forgiveness is not optional, but a definite act of the will to forgive. In obedience to God's command, the feeling comes later, that feeling of peace. It comes later. But we first must offer up to God as an offering our hurts and our despair. And then God will pour his love and compassion into the wounds and his healing will come. As he was saying these words, Mary sitting there thinking about that dress and, and an opportunity that afternoon to show, them, show that dress to the bishop, she began to think to herself, I can't forgive him because and I just can't forget what he's done to me. Well, the bishop continued his sermon. He said this, and I quote, Someone here may be thinking, I can never forget, even if I could forgive. Well, you're right. You can't forget. But you needn't be devastated by the remembering. God's love and God's forgiveness can and will cushion the memory until the imprint is gone, until its force is gone. When you forgive, you must destroy the evidence and remember only to love. And those words just burnt into Mary's heart like a hot iron. You must destroy the evidence. And she thought of that ripped up dress that she had hidden in the trunk. And, and could he have possibly known? There's no way he would have known. Why would he say destroy the evidence? She didn't hear the rest of his sermon. She was wrestling with herself, with what she would do. But those words she couldn't escape. Destroy the evidence. Take your herd and make it an offering unto God. She knew she'd be home before John and the bishop came for dinner. She would finish up her cooking. They cooked over a, a wood stove. You know, the old wooden stoves would both heat the house and cook the food. And She got home first and she went up to that trunk and she got out that ripped up dress. And as she was just taking some food out of the warming box that was a part of that stove, she decided to obey the word of God. She pulled one of the iron lids off that stove and seeing the flames inside, she took that dress, the evidence, and she dropped it in. No sooner did she let go of it, but the door came open behind her. It was John. The bishop wasn't with him. He had gotten deterred, but John was there. John, what are you doing? Nothing. What are you doing? I'm destroying the evidence as my offering to God. So he came over to see what in the world she was talking about, and he recognized the fabric had not yet been consumed. He recognized what it was. Something inside him broke. Please forgive me, Mary. Please forgive me. She never told the bishop. She destroyed the evidence. She made it an offering unto God. What's the end of the story for Mary and John? Well, Mary wrote in her diary, 58 years later, John had passed on to be with the Lord, and they had had 58 years of, yes, up and down, not always easy, but things changed after that day. And, and, and 58 years of serving God together in these country churches. John had died at the time she wrote this. John had died a few weeks, and she missed him terribly. But she wrote of a dream she had, strange, 
Because in this dream she saw three angels flying toward her. And one of the angels said with an excited voice, Come Mary, we will show you the celebration. And when she looked at that angel, draped over that angel's arm, was a beautiful pink dress with violets and lace. And she knew that God was saying to her 58 years later, See Mary, I accepted your offer. And today the imperative that I want us to talk about is is simply that one word used by Jesus where he said, forgive. The, The common position for the religious leaders when they prayed was to stand. And so Jesus said, when you stand praying, forgive. It is my will that you will to forgive. And 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 if you don't. Your Father in heaven will not forgive you. So maybe today some of us will destroy some evidence. Maybe today some of us will offer up to God a new offering to Him. Something we've been holding on to, nursing along, feeding. It's only been really eating away at ourselves. Forgive. Well, what is forgiveness? I think we have a hard time forgiving because we don't know what it is. Not, now, last week, we're going to jump back in time. Last week, we looked at the words of Jesus, Luke 9. Remember where he said, if any man wants to follow me, if he desires to follow me, let him deny himself. And we talked about the word forsake, where it says the disciples, they forsook their nets and followed Jesus. Uh, that word forsake, by the way, is the same base word as the word forgive. It means to either, and the context determines, it means to either send something away or to leave it. The idea is of separation. I'm not going to hang on to it. In, in the case of the boats, they left the boats. But in, when we use the word forgive, we use it in the sense of sending away. Sending away. Remember the Leviticus 16 scapegoat, the Day of Atonement, It has this whole concept of sending away, and and that is the springboard for our New Testament understanding of forgiveness. In the Old Testament, sin was covered over. We call that atonement. In the New Testament, sin is sent away. We call that forgiveness. And so the the two two goats in Leviticus 16, one was slaughtered, slain, blood drained, and offered. The other, the priests laid their hands upon it, Uh, thus uh, symbolically placing the sin of the nation upon it, and that goat was sent away. So there is your picture, blood covers, but then it must be forgiven, sent away. And so now Jesus says, this cup, it is the blood of the new covenant shed for you for the remitting, the sending away of sin. And that's that's the word we're looking at, that that Jesus said, unless you're willing to send away someone's sin, and it has with it the idea of release, letting go. You don't hold on to it, you you release it, you let it it go. Write down this phrase. By the way, there's no PowerPoints this morning on purpose. I want you to flip over your bulletin and get ready to fill in the blanks on the back. I wanted you to hear more than you write today because... I know God wants to speak to our hearts about this imperative, forgive, forgive. And and we we look at at this passage of Jesus where, where in response to faith and mountain moving, he says, when you stand praying, forgive, send it away, don't hang on to it, separate. That's the idea of forgiving. I'm going to push this on down the road. I, I don't want it anymore. I'm sending it away. If you are nursing a grudge, it's time to send it away. Stop feeding it. Do you know where that phrase comes from, nursing a grudge? That means you're feeding it. It's time to stop feeding the offense and send it away and separate yourself from it. That's that's forgiveness. That's, That's really what we're talking about. But what it really means also is to choose to not hold something against. And we will elaborate that when we look at the word remember. Well, turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 18. I actually have two texts 
today. The first one was just by way of introduction, that, that imperative where, where Jesus, Jesus said, forgive, that's the imperative. But now he gives an example, a parable, a teaching on forgiveness. So turn to Matthew chapter 18, and this is where we will spend the balance of our time. Matthew chapter 18, I'm going to start reading with verse 21. The context is Jesus has been teaching on church discipline. Someone offends you, you go to them, try and get it right. They, they won't reconcile. You go to the elders, they still refuse that. Then it comes before the whole church. There's binding, there's losing. It's all, all in that context. But look at verse 21. Then Peter came to him, Jesus, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. So a measurement of money. And as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. Get that in your mind. This guy's going to be sold and his wife is going to be sold off and his children are going to be sold off. This is going to cost this guy everything. That's the situation he's in. Verse 26, the servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me. I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released and forgave him. There's your concepts, getting separated. Release, set him free, send away. Released and forgave him the debt. In other words, this debt, I'm sending it away. It's no longer attached to you. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him. Some translation says, choked him, took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe me. Look at the contrast there. What does the king do? The king says, I release. What does this man do? I grab. See the picture? Opposites. I release, says the king. But the man says, no, I choke. I grab. Opposite. And so he begins to choke this guy. And, and, and this, guy, this guy only owed him 10 denarii, not much at all. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll pay you all. Same thing that he had said, except for the Lord part, Master. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told the king what had been done. Then the master, the king, came and called him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you, each of you, if you do not forgive from the heart your brother his trespasses. Well, that's our instructional text for today. And look at your bulletin. And the first thing I want you to simply write down is, is, is I'm going to give you four phrases for forgiveness. Four phrases for forgiveness. All out of this parable. We're going to use this parable as, as a launching pad for four principles that will help you forgive. That will that, make forgiveness more understandable so that we can do it so that we can indeed forgive. I've tried to put it, these principles into short little phrases that hopefully you can remember. And here's the first one. Number one, you can if you have. Just fill in those blanks. You can if you have. What do I mean? You can forgive if you have been forgiven. There's a lot of people who say, oh, I just can't forgive what they did to me. Pastor, if you knew what they did to me, I just can't forgive. Well, here, let's just stop a moment. If you're a born-again Christian, you've got to start telling yourself the truth. Stop telling yourself a lie. It is not true that you can't. If you have been forgiven, you can forgive. You might not want to forgive. You might not feel like forgiving. You might be so overwhelmed with your own pain, but don't say you can't. You can if you have. Now, Jesus gave this parable as an instruction. And, and notice the reaction of the king. He said, you should have had compassion, but you didn't. He expected him to have compassion. 
And that means I expected you to release this guy just like I released you. And look at verse 30, and the exact wording of it is, when he met that other guy, he could have let him go, but it says he would not. That's a phrase of the will. That was his choice. He, he would not. The guy said, have compassion on me and, and forgive me the dead. And, 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 and it says he would not. But he could have. He could have. In Luke chapter 17, I see a little humor in the next verse, although I'm not sure it's appropriate to tie it together. But in verses 1 through 4, uh, Jesus said, you know, if somebody sins against you and they turn, forgive them. If they sin again and they turn, forgive them. If they sin again and they turn, forgive them. And he goes into that seven times, forgive them. And then one of the, one of the disciples says, oh, increase our faith. This is hard to do. Increase our faith. But notice Jesus said, if they turn, you must forgive them. Well, how can he demand you do something you're not able to do? He knows you have the ability to do it, or he wouldn't tell you to do it. You can if you have. If you have been forgiven, you can forgive. Why do we get tripped up on this? And here's, here's one of the tripping points that, that I believe we, we fail to understand. The first thing I want you to understand is forgiveness is a choice. It's not a feeling. It's a choice. Remember Bishop Hansen in the story we introduced this message with? Well, what was his, his topic was on forgiving. And he said, you will get the feeling after you do it. Feelings follow the choosing. You choose to forgive. Don't base, don't base your having forgiven on a feeling. You choose to forgive. And you might still feel as hurt as you did before. But you choose to say from this day forward, I am not going to hold this on that person. I'm going to let go of it. And, and the longer you walk in that, the more your feelings will change. One of the problems with we Westerners, we're way too feeling oriented. We need, to be, we need to be oriented according to commitment. We live by commitment and the feelings get in line. If you live by your feelings only, we will never progress as overcomers. Because we need to battle our feelings and overcome our feelings. No, forgiveness is a choice. And this man had a choice. And someone who owed him a pity, just a, a, a pittance compared to what he owed, and he would not. He chose not to. Forgiveness is a choice. Here's the second thing that trips us up. As we confuse forgetting with forgiving, There's, they're not the same. They're not the same at all. And I'll explain to you how that all kind of works out because there are passages in the Bible like, I'll just write, you can write these down, Isaiah 43, 25, Isaiah 44, 22. This says the Lord blots out our transgression. Micah chapter 7, 18 and 19 says he, he, he doesn't remember our sins. He throws them into the sea. Now what do you think that means, that he doesn't remember your sins? Does it really mean like you're praying and you say, Oh God, you know, I'm, I'm feeling tempted with that same thing. I, I, I'm sorry, Lord. I, I know I dealt with this a year ago. but I'm feeling, And God says, What in the world are you talking about? Do you think God just is dumbfounded that he... He has no mental recollection of what you're talking about. Oh, could you describe that sin to me in detail? I have no memory of that sin. That's not what that means. That is, that is not what the Bible means by, by forgetting. For even our parable, what was the answer to Jesus? Peter says, should we forgive seven times? And we'll look at why he said seven in a few moments. But Jesus said, no, you forgive 70 times seven. How much is that? Anybody... Uh, 490, 490. If somebody did something to you 490 times in one day, is it practical to think you could forget? I don't think so. I mean, it just defies the way our brain works. If somebody did something against you 490 times in the same day, there's no way you're going to forget. After 489 times, they do it the, the 90th time. You say, whoa, what was that? I have no idea what that was. No, that's not what he means by forgetting. Let me give you a little definition. I know it's not the same as our English word at all. To remember means to act according. Think of how God speaks of the Sabbath. What does he tell them to do with the Sabbath? Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. He doesn't say, do the Sabbath. 
But in the original Hebrew, and it's captured by most of your, your translations, it says, remember the Sabbath. In other words, this day is to be holy, so you act according to that. It means to act according to. When he says, I do not remember your sins, he's basically saying, I have chosen not to act according to your sinfulness. I've chosen not to hold that against you. I've chosen to act toward you differently. I'm not putting your sins in the forefront of my mind when I'm thinking about you. I'm setting them aside and I'm acting according to love. And I'm acting according to mercy. I am not acting according to your sin. We think of remembering and forgetting only in terms of, of knowledge of facts. And actually, it's more of an action-oriented word in the original. To not remember means I will not act according. And look at Psalm 103. Turn there if you would. Psalm 103 is a, a phenomenal song on for, a psalm on forgiveness and, and, and defining this whole thing. Psalm 103. It says in verse 10, for example, he says, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Why? He doesn't remember them. In other words, he, he, he sets them aside. He does not treat us according to them. So I know it's a different way of using the word. Do you get the idea? And so, so your husband really did you dirt. Your wife really stabbed you in the back, and now you're divorced, whatever the context situation. Are you going to live the rest of your life and just have amnesia and have no knowledge of that? No. There's going to be a lot of things in your life as a, as a result of that. But you can choose not to hold that against whoever did that to you. That's what it means not to remember. And I like what Bishop Hansen said in his sermon. As you offer it up to God, yes, you will remember, but God will lessen the impact of that memory. And as time goes on, as you continue to love and, and pray for those people, the, the emotional impact of what they did will, will get less and less. Until one day you can think, oh yeah, they did that to me. <laughs> Thank God I'm free. Look at the life I have. It's not that you have amnesia about what they did. It's just that it no longer impacts you in the same emotional way. And you're not living according to that. You're living a different way. It means to release, to choose not to hold against. Abraham Lincoln was once asked toward the end, you know, right before he was shot, and, and it was pretty certain at that time the North was going to win, and, and they were starting to think, how do we put this all back together, Reconstruction? And, and, and he was asked one day, how are you going to treat the Confederate states once the war is over? And he said this, and I quote, I will endeavor to treat them as if they never left. I will endeavor to treat them. Does that mean he was ignorant that there's going to be things to be worked through? No. He said, I will endeavor to treat them as if they never left. How does God treat you when you come back to his son Jesus? I will endeavor to treat them as if they never left. Now, did the father of the prodigal son just totally go amnesia that his son had left and squandered the inheritance? No, he would always remember that, especially when he did his money. But he would endeavor to treat him as if he's found again. He would endeavor to treat him who was dead as if he was now alive. He would forgive. And that's what God is saying to us today. If, if you've got something you could hold on someone because of something they've actually done, uh, actually done against you, choose to let it go. Just, just let it go. You can if you have. Briefly, how then can you be forgiven by God? It's really simple. It's already provided, paid for. But you must believe that Jesus did pay for it in his death on the cross. And, and you must turn to him. And we call that repentance a turning. And we confess and acknowledge our sins. And find out when we do that that he is faithful and just to forgive us. To no longer hold it against us. To no longer treat us according to our sins. Psalm 103 has not dealt with us according to our sins. By the way, and I, you got to love Peter. I'm glad Jesus chose Peter. Peter does, Peter does so many things that you and I would do, but maybe didn't have the nerve to do. But Peter, I think, thought Jesus would commend him. 
I think Peter was going to show Jesus how spiritual he is, that he's really catching on to what Jesus is teaching. Because the rabbis in Jesus' day taught that you should only forgive three times. This is interesting. They, they quote Amos where it says, yea, for three, even for four. And, and, and they taught that, that and, and here's their rationale. If in Amos it says three times, and then judgment comes on four, they're, they're misapplying the prophecy altogether. But, but they said you can't be more gracious than God. It is an arrogant thing to think you're more gracious than God. And so if God only forgives three times, we should only forgive three times. So somebody sins against you, forgive them. Somebody sins against you, second time, forgive them. Somebody sins against you, a third time, forgive them. Somebody sins against you, a fourth time, obliterate them. You're not more gracious than God. And so here's Peter thinking, well, now I know the rabbis, they teach you've got to forgive three times, but no more than three. Now Jesus talking about love, mercy. Hey, let's double it and add one. Jesus, how, how, so how many times should we forgive somebody? Seven? And I can just see Peter sitting there waiting for the commendation, waiting for the, wow, Peter, you're really spiritual. And Jesus blew him away when he said, no, Peter, seven times 70. Now, does that mean we're limited now from three of the rabbis, seven of Peter, 490 of Jesus on 491, now we can obliterate them? Now, that was Jesus' way of saying without limit. No limit. There's no limit to his forgiveness of me. How can I put a limit on my forgiveness of anyone else? No limit. And, and, and so we, if we have been forgiven, then we, we can forgive. If we have been forgiven, we can forgive. Uh, phrase number two, fill this in. First one was you can if you have. Number two, gratitude determines attitude. Not just trying to be clever with a rhyme there, but it does make sense when we explain it. Gratitude determines attitude. What is your attitude toward other people? What was this man in the parable that would not forgive? What was his attitude toward someone that owed him money? Well, it was vengeful, wasn't it? He, he grabbed him by the neck. He wanted to choke life out of him. Pay me what you owe me. By the way, what that guy owed him was probably a little less than a day's wage. And what he owed the king. Now, the contrast in the debt here is incredible. 10,000 talents. If you took Idiomene, uh, uh, the providence, and then you took uh, Galilee, if you took Judea, if you took Samaria, and you added them all up, what was their total revenue as providences? Their total revenue was less than 1,000 talents. This guy owes 10,000 talents. It would be like more than the state of California is in debt. I mean, that, you say, wow, can't even fathom that. And so this guy owed an overwhelming debt. The man that owed him money only owed him less than a day's wages. Look at it this way. One guy calculated how, how, to, how to carry that money. In those days, they didn't have paper money. They didn't wire money. They didn't have uh, accounts and electronics. You had to actually carry the money. You know how many people it would take to carry the money that guy owed the king? It would take 8,600 people carrying heavy sacks. They, they needed all their strength to carry. And if you lined them up one after the other, it would be five miles long. That's how many people it would take to carry the money he owed the king. What he was owed would fit in a pocket. The ratio is one to, to 500,000. What a contrast. Could he have forgiven? Sure, he could have forgiven. If I came up to you today, those of you that have a mortgage, if I came up to you today and I said, you know what, I, 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 I'm, I'm rich. And I don't know what to do with all my money, so I'm going to pay off your mortgage. Would you have a little extra cash you could do something else with? Would you walk away saying, hey, wow, yeah, I can buy you lunch. Yeah, man. I don't have to pay my mortgage. See, if I release you from your debt, that frees you to do some other things. If you have been forgiven, you can forgive. But do you appreciate forgiveness? Do I appreciate forgiveness? This man that was forgiven this incredible debt, did he appreciate that? No, he did not. He was not at all grateful for his forgiveness. And so when he saw someone who owed him a, a pittance, he went crazy on him. You probably know where I'm headed with this. What is what someone has done against you compared to what you and I have done against God. 
a holy God whom I have offended? And I need to be real frank with all of us here today. Make no mistake about it. We have offended God. God is holy. And we have violated His laws and we've gone our own way and we've taken the life that He gave us and consumed it only upon ourselves rather than for His glory. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have offended God. All of us. And so when someone offends you, what is that compared to my offending God? Nothing. Less than a day's wages. And so if I am truly grateful for what God has done for me, I express that gratitude in my attitude towards someone else. It is, and you no, know, here's how we gauge it. Here's how, here's how we determine attitude. We determine attitude against someone or for someone based on the severity of their offense against us. If it's a little minor offense, ah, oh, you know, no big deal. They didn't know what they were doing. They're, they're kind of dumb anyway, and we just let it go. But man, if they did something big, if they did something severe, we say, I could never forgive that. Well, what are you basing your forgiveness on? You're basing it on the severity of their offense. Rather than base your forgiveness on your gratitude to God. If I want God to truly know I'm grateful for Him forgiving me, then I forgive someone else. It is your gratitude that determines your attitude. And in Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, Jesus, in another context completely, but I believe the principle applies, Jesus said, freely you've received. Finish the statement for me. Freely give. Have you freely received forgiveness? Did you do anything for it? Did you earn it? You might say, well, that person hasn't repented. They don't deserve me to forgive them. No, they don't. But I didn't deserve Jesus to forgive me. It was not because of acts of righteousness, works of righteousness that I have done, but according to his mercy, according to his love, Titus 3, 5. While I was his enemy, he demonstrated his love by dying on a cross. Did I deserve to be forgiven? Absolutely not. But if I'm grateful for that, I will not allow the severity of someone's offense toward me to determine my attitude toward them. What should determine my attitude toward them is my gratitude toward God. If I am grateful to God because He loves me, I will love others. If I'm grateful to God because He has released me, then I will release others. It is your gratitude that determines your attitude, not the severity of what they've done. Psalm 86, verse 5, he says, Lord, you're good and you're ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon Him. You know, God is ready to forgive. God is eager to forgive. How about me? Am I ready to forgive? Am I eager to, to, to forgive? Or does the Spirit just have to kind of pull it out of me? We wrestle with it, don't we? I do. I, I have a feeling you do too. But I need to be grateful for what God has done for me. And then I, 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 I express that to, to others. Isaiah 55, 7 Return to the Lord and He will have compassion. He will abundantly pardon. Abundantly. Freely you've received. Freely give. Ephesians 2, 5. We're saved because He's rich in mercy. But, but we only forgive to the extent that we are willing to surrender our rights. Notice what Jesus said in Mark chapter 11. He said, if when you're praying, if you have something against someone. And literally what that means is, Think of it in a legal sense. If you have something on them, they're really wrong, you know it, you can prove it. You're not wrong, they are. If you have something on them, if they have some, you have something against them, he says, release them. Why? Because God had something on me. And he released me. If I'm grateful for that, then I need to surrender. Did God have a right to send me to hell? Absolutely. I have absolutely no right to question his judging me. He's God. He's holy. Did he have a right to condemn me forever? Yes, he did. But he chose to lay that right aside and die on a cross. Do we appreciate that? Then that should be expressed in our granting forgiveness to others. Colossians 3 13 says why we should bear with one another, why we should forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. 
Archibald Hart put it this way. He said, forgiveness is my surrendering my right to hurt you for hurting me. See, if somebody hurts me, if someone hurts you, we have a right. We have a right to want to hurt them. Be careful. You're in a danger zone. We didn't deserve being forgiven. So let us be grateful for our forgiveness and have that attitude toward others. Number three. Number one, simply, you can if you have. Number two, gratitude determines attitude. Number three, if you refuse, you lose. If you refuse, you lose. Neither will my heavenly Father forgive you. If you refuse to forgive others, you will lose. What happened in the parable? The man was turned over to the tormentors. He lost. And look at what he lost. He didn't just lose himself, his children, his wife. He lost. If you refuse, you lose. Even in the teaching of the Lord's Prayer. You know, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And then he finished the prayer. And he said, because if you don't forgive those who trespass against you, your Father won't forgive you your trespasses. If you, if you refuse, you lose. Why? Matthew 7, 1 and 2. With the same measure you meet it out, it will be measured back unto you. Luke chapter 6. Give, it shall be given unto you. We, always, we like to quote that one at offering time. But you read that passage, Luke 6, 36 through 38. And, and, and it's talking about judgment and love and forgiveness and mercy, those kind of things. You give that out, you're going to get that back. But if you refuse, you lose. Well, well you're turned over to torment. It's like unanswered prayer. In the context of prayer, he said, you can have faith that moves a mountain, but if you don't forgive, you won't even be forgiven. Unanswered prayer. Husbands, listen to me. Don't ever become bitter with your wife. Some husbands, you, you have gotten, we have gotten sometimes, if you, you put us all in one big category, there's a bunch of husbands that, that, that nothing their wife ever does is good. Why? Because your heart's filled with bitterness, and bitterness clouds your vision, so you see no good in her anymore. And the Bible says, husbands, love your wives, Colossians 3.19, and do not become bitter against her. That's a command to the husband. And he says in 1 Peter chapter 3, 7, if you don't treat your wife right, God's going to cut off your prayers, throw them away. Unanswered prayer. How about physical illness? Proverbs eleven seventeen. 17, people that get resentful, people, people that, that are bitter and unforgiving, it says they are wounding themselves. Uh, one doctor was quoted as saying to a, to a patient, if you don't cut out your resentment, I'm going to have to cut out your intestine. Because of the effects of that kind of attitude and bitterness and and unforgiveness, it, it can take a toll even on somebody uh, physically. But I want you to turn to James chapter 2. If you have a Bible, just go ahead and turn there or look it up on your, your Bible app. I want you to see these words with your own eyes because I saw something that scared me. See, if you refuse, you lose. James chapter 2, and I'm going to make a statement. You're going to maybe want to, want to stone me as a heretic, but hear me out. If you refuse to forgive someone else, you are placing yourself back under the law. Well, what was the law? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I'm not just talking about the Ten Commandments, but you are placing yourself under the principle of law, not grace. And anybody that knows anything about God relating to people based on law. Anybody that knows anything about that does not want to be in that situation. But listen to these words of James chapter 2. And we quoted it last week about loving your neighbor. But James chapter 2, beginning with verse 10. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he's guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Not the, not, not the Old Testament law, the law of liberty. Loving God with all your heart, loving your neighbor. Look at verse 13. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. 
What is he saying? He says in that passage, he says, if you break one part of the law, you will be dealt with as if you've broken all the law. But he says, the one who shows no mercy, there won't be any mercy for that person. Wow. Do I want to be in that position before God? Do I want to stand before God and have there be absolutely no mercy available to me? Because I would not exercise mercy toward another. And, and now I'm, I'm, I'm making these words up. These are not scripture words, all right? So evaluate them that way. But it's as if God would be saying to you, hey, you treated other people by law, now I'm going to treat you by law. By the way, you're guilty of all of it. And you're going to be turned over the tormentors until you pay off all of it. The only trouble is I can't pay off all of it. That's why it's eternal punishment. I don't want to be in that. I don't, I don't want that. So someone, someone offends you, someone has sinned against you, ask yourself one question. How do I want to live? Do I want to live by law or do I want to live by grace? How do I want to relate to God? By law or by grace? Then you treat that other person the way you want to be treated by God. If you refuse, you lose, and something begins to grow within us called bitterness. We defile many. Notice this guy's wife and kids were also locked up. Bitterness. Last phrase, I know we've got to close. Number one, you can if you have. Number two, gratitude determines attitude. Gratitude determines attitude. And we also see these principles, if you refuse, you lose. Last thing, it's just a phrase, I want you to fill it in. For Christ's sake. For Christ's sake. Asking this question, why did God forgive you? Why did God forgive me? Well, I might say, well, he forgave me because I believe in Jesus. Well... Not quite the right answer. Yeah, you do have to believe in Jesus, but that's not the basis of His forgiveness. Well, He forgives me because I repented. Well, you do need to repent, but that's not the basis of His forgiveness. I confess my sins. Yeah, you have to confess your sins, but that is not the basis for forgiveness. That's all a part of the process of entering into forgiveness and receiving it. But the basis of all forgiveness is one event in history. Jesus died for sin. That and that alone is the basis of forgiveness. Anything else is from within me and God will not count anything that's from within me. I have offended Him. I am a sinner. I am a fallen creation. There is nothing in me upon which He can base His forgiveness. God's forgiveness is based solely, completely, totally upon the cross of Jesus Christ. His sacrificial death on our behalf. We are forgiven. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32. God forgave us for Christ's sake. Now up to this point I've been telling you why you should forgive others for your sake. Right? I mean, you don't want to lose. You don't want to become bitter. You don't want to be sick and afflicted and have a lousy life and die alone because nobody can stand you. You don't want to live like that. You, that, that. That's not to be your testimony. So forgive, be gracious, be kind. But all of that is for your sake. There's a higher motive to forgive those who hurt you. Make it an offering unto Him. Make it an offering unto Him. And forgive for Jesus' sake. Take that pain and your right to want to inflict pain. You have a right. They violated you. They have offended you. They meant it for evil. You have rights. But will you take those rights and surrender them as an offering to God? Will you take your pain and say, Lord, I've always wanted to be more like you. Help me to forgive. I bet every believer in this room at one point in your Christian life has prayed, Lord, I want to be more like you. You will never, ever be more like Jesus than at the moment you forgive. 
Forgiveness is the only principle upon which God can relate to us. If he related to us by law, we'd all be destroyed. If he related to us only by our works, we would all fall short. If he related to us only by our inerrant goodness, we would all be alienated forever from him because there is none in us compared to his holiness. God's only basis to forgive you is the death of his son Jesus, the propitiation for our sins. So I owe him everything. And somebody comes along and owes me a nickel. Am I going to put my hands on his throat and shake him and say, pay me? Or am I going to say, you know what, I've been forgiven so much, I don't need your nickel. I, I've been set free by, by Jesus. I've been set free from so much, I don't, I don't need this right anymore. I let it go. That's forgiveness. A couple other points and I close. Just, just remember this. How, how can I forgive 70 times 7? And by the way, a little grammar lesson real quick. We, we've been talking about imperative. But it's also in the present tense where he says forgive. That means continual action. That means you just do it again and again and again and again. Oh, I thought I'd already forgiven him. Yeah, you did. And then you remembered it or they did something. And then you felt that pain again. Well, then forgive him again. Let it be continual. Number one, receive God's forgiveness. We've talked about that. Number two, choose to forgive. It's, a, it's an act of your will, not a feeling. This one's important. Number three, see God involved in their offense. God allowed it. Remember, Joseph, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You, you, you guys didn't send me to Egypt. God sent me here. Remember how he had that attitude in, in Genesis 45 and 50? Chapter 45, chapter 50. He saw God involved, the sovereignty of God. If somebody has betrayed you, somebody's hurt you, you know what? God's going to use that. See God in it. See the hand of God in it. Purify your heart and you'll see God. You let bitterness in your heart, you won't see God in it. But you, blessed are pure in heart, then you'll see God. Get that bitterness out of your heart by forgiveness. You'll see God working in that. See God. See Him working. Keep a soft heart. Why do we harden our hearts? We harden our hearts as a defense mechanism against pain. We don't want to have pain, so we harden our heart. But if you harden your heart, you also will no longer feel the presence of God. If you harden your heart against pain, you will no longer feel joy or peace or anything. You'll be a rock. Don't harden your heart. Keep it soft, which means it'll always be hurting. It's okay. Look at Joseph, how every time he turns around, he's finding some place to weep. But he was forgiving. Keep your heart soft. Say, well, but it'll hurt. Yeah, I know. Offer it to Jesus. Let it be an offering to him, sacrifice to him. And pray for him. Didn't Jesus tell you to pray for those people that despitefully use you? Not just those that out of ignorance hurt you. No, pray for those who persecute you and despitefully use you and curse you and all of that. Matthew 5, 43 through 48. Forgive. Let's stand together, shall we? And, and Connie, musicians, would you come? And We're going to take a moment. And, and as we stand here, not just because we're in a building that we call church, but because we've gathered in the name of Jesus. I want us all to stand here for a moment and realize Jesus is here 